Hello everyone and welcome to the third uh, LAST and YSA webinar series on science, technology, innovation and development policy experiences for Latin America and the Caribbean. This event is uh, a collaboration between the Latin American Science, Technology, Innovation and Development Discussion Group mentored by Carlota Perez and the Young Scholars Initiative. My name is Pavel Korijokia, PhD from SPRU, the University of Sussex. And today we have the pleasure to have in Mariana Matsukato, uh, Matsukato uh, founding director of IIPP at UCL, to discuss how academia can and should support policymakers. Before I pass the word to Carlota and Mariana uh, and properly introduce them, here's the agenda of the day. The conversation will take around 50 minutes, followed by 30 minutes of questions and answers from the, from the audience. And first, a few words about uh, the Latin American group. Uh, it started at face-to-face uh, -face, uh, meetings, but now we have an online series of meetings that have taken, and it, this started uh, at SPRU since uh, 2018. This is a space where people are invited to give a talk about their experiences and in the design and implementation of STI and development, development policy by analyzing and contrasting different experiences, what works, what doesn't work. We aim at uh, having lessons for future interventions in the region. Our motivation comes from the perception that interactions between policy and academia are, is still very weak in our countries. So we recognize that uh, more knowledgeable civil servants, policymakers with the skills and competence are necessary for the state to lead a way out of the climate emergency and other societal challenges and towards a better uh, soci uh, socioeconomic outcome. So if you want to stay tuned, make sure you are receiving our emails. If you want to subscribe to this, uh, a group, you can send an email to this email account that you are seeing on your screen. Uh, you could also join the group on LinkedIn and you can check uh, the lalix.org website for our previous events. We record every talk so you can uh, see the last presentations of this group. Now is the time for the Young Scholars Initiative to be introduced. Fernanda, please. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. So hello, everyone. I'm Fernanda. I am a coordinator of the Economics of Innovation Working Group at Young Scholars Initiative. I just want to say a few words about YSI. Uh, the YSI is a community of over 20,000 young, young academics and early career researchers from around the world. Our activities are mainly organizing academic events such as webinars like these, PhD workshops, reading groups, and you are all welcome to participate in these events. We have some exciting events coming up in the coming months. Uh, if you are an uh, early career academic or would you like to organize something of interest to early career academics, you are most welcome to contact us and tell us about your idea. And thank you for the opportunity to participate in this project, Professor Carlotta. Um, yeah, I wish everyone a fruitful webinar. Thank you, Fernanda. Let's continue with some uh, suggestions for, for the meeting. Uh, this is going to be recorded and shared in, on YouTube. And please uh, feel free to, to participate uh, through the chat box for questions. I'll be keeping a list uh, with the order of people who want to ask questions, or, or I can uh, read the questions myself if you want. So please uh, write the chat uh, on the chat, and if you have questions, and I will give you the floor. Also, feel free to make comments, suggestions, and start discussions. So let me introduce our speaker. Uh, I hope we make a right summary of her experience. Uh, dissatisfied with the standard economics, Professor Matsukato has, uh, has made major theoretical contributions in several books and articles, from the entrepreneurial state to the value of everything, mission economy, and more recently, the big con. 
She challenges orthodox thinking about the role of the state and the private sector in driving innovation, how economic value is created, measured and shared, and how market shaping policy can be designed in a mission oriented way to solve the grand challenges facing humanity, but only if the capacity of the public sector is not outsourced away. The new economic thinking she advocates is based on new concepts of market shaping, not fixing right by value and public purpose. Contributions that have earned her several globally important awards. She currently advises policymakers around the world on innovation led inclusive and sustainable growth in multilateral organizations such as the United Nations, the European Commission, and the OECD as well as in specific countries such as Argentina, South Africa, Sweden, Colombia, eh, among others. Eh, through her role in special advice, as a special advisor for the European Commission Commissioner for Science, eh, Research Science and Innovation, she authored a high impact report on mission-oriented research and innovation in the European Union, and more recently authored a report for the UN's Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, on transformational change with mission-oriented approach. The institute she founded at UCL offers a practice-based theorizing approach, bringing learning from the ground, practice and policy to theoretical research, and even the curriculum for the bold new masters in public administration program. Thank you, Mariana, for being here and sharing your experience. And we have, uh, discussing with uh, Mariana, we have Carlota Perez, honorary professor of uh, IIPP at UCL and SPRU at the University of Sussex. She's adjunct professor, professor at the Reiner North sea School of Taltec. She's the author of Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital and many other works. She has been chairing these meetings since the beginning, five years ago. And uh, thank you a lot, Carlota, for opening these spaces for sharing different experiences. So the floor is yours, Carlota. Thank you, Pavel. Uh, thank you, Mariana, for accepting. I know how busy your schedule is, and I know this is really special for you to have taken the time to talk to us. And this is very important because the whole idea is to try to make academia and policymaking and politicians uh, to come closer together, and you are somebody who has managed to do that very well. So actually, before we talk about the topic of this session, which is the role of academics in supporting policymakers, I'd actually like to ask you a very personal question. What's the secret of your amazing super active life? As an economist, you develop and write innovative theory while acting as an international speaker and consultant, as founding director of IIPP, an innovative institution where you lead, teach, supervise, attend seminars and events. In between, you're also the caring mother of four, and you still find time to enjoy life, going to parks, museums, theaters, and for proper holidays. But it's more amazing is that you excel at all four tasks and are a wonderful and generous friend, which I know very well. How do you do it? What's the secret? So first of all, that's not true. <laughs> it is true, Mariana. No, 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 no. no, I mean, it's, well, okay. I have an answer. I should have thought about this before because you did kind of warn me of what you were gonna ask me, but as you know, I have a, uh, I not attention deficit disorder, but anyway, I don't pay attention and then I, I show up and have so to, it's precisely and have to the wing it. But, I no. have the answer. Yeah, you but I think the answer, the answer, no, but the answer is the answer. In other words, the answer I just gave, which is it's not true, is in some ways the answer. Because if one wanted to be the best in all those things, you would die. <laughs> so in some ways, what I've tried to do, I mean, this is, I guess, the more personal side, it's not the academic side, but you know how in microeconomic theory, some of the best critiques were about contrasting maximization with satisficing. And the truth is that even just theoretically, not only might we find all sorts of problems with the idea of, you know, maximizing behavior in neoclassical economics and so on, but actually that's not how firms behave. 
to adapt to complexity, they satisfy. Like all the evolutionary economics, you know, kind of started with that idea of routines and so on. And in some ways, it's also true with me. When I had my kids, and I had four kids in five years, but two were twins, so I cheated. The only way to survive was to satisfy. If I wanted them to be the best dressed, the cleanest, the best fed, go to the best school, the best sports, the best music, the best this, the best that, I would have died. And I think what we did was we set routines. And I think you know some of the routines because you've seen them. But for me, it's been about prioritizing what's really important and what's very important for me that I have no tolerance for kind of, you know, making too many exceptions is having dinner together and speaking. So we have a, a, a funny thing. Actually, my friends make fun of me because I do it with my friends too. If there's a dinner party, instead of everyone just doing little chats, you know, like buffet style, I have what we call a structured conversation. <laughs> so there's a question and you go around the table and everyone converses. And when the kids were small, the question was just literally best thing, worst thing. Tell us the best thing that happened today and the worst thing that happened today. And it's just a simple little rule, which almost forces you to talk and to listen. Also, because if I think of the four kids, two are, you know, the two first ones were much more in some ways uh, confident than the twins who were born together and those had to share. And they had all these other four people in the family that were always screaming. So they tended to kind of listen. But by doing that, we had to listen to them because there was a structured question. But I feel like that in general is really important to just decide what really matters. So even the Institute or as an academic, if all you care about is your H factor, <laughs> if all you care about is, um, you know, you can think of all the different metrics, you would kind of go crazy. So right now for the Institute, for me, what was really important was not to do everything. It was set up five years ago, by the way, but to really focus, for example, on the educational program. For me, that was the biggest kind of metric of success was to make to have a new educational platform for MPA students. So people mainly who are going to go work in government or who already work in government. And we really focused on that. So at the same time, you know, we might write books and articles, but the, the focusing device of Reiner Cattell and myself, the deputy director, was on that as the core. And of course, we, we did other things. We had impact on policy and so on. But I do think that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the way you adapt to complexity. Um, mm. The other thing is, I think a good rule in life is just, I, I know this is going to sound stupid, like very corny, but to always do what you think really matters, because then nothing can go wrong. Because even if you make mistakes, uh, even if it's bumpy and you fail and so on, at least along the way, you were doing what you really cared about, and then it might not work out. Whereas I see a lot of even students in high schools, when they're told, you know, study this because then you can get a job or in college, you know, do this because then that'll happen. If along the way, you're really following what your heart is kind of telling you is the right thing to do, then it's actually impossible to go wrong because any experience you have along the way is something you can learn from. And I think for me, definitely what I ended up studying, like at the new school, you know, for social research, which you get kind of tabooed as a Marxist. So it's obviously going to be harder to get a job later than going to a more traditional department. And I'm sure most of the people on the screen today made similar choices. You know, what matters then is making your own little puzzle. So you might you know, go to the new school, which is known for one thing, but then making your own collage of experiences around it, which are really unique to you. But also again, following your heart that it doesn't matter if people tell you, what are you going to the new school for? You should go to this other place that gave you a full scholarship. You wouldn't even have to take out any loan. I'm very happy that along the way, and again, I'm sure this is something that everyone here on the screen today shares, that if you're guided by what you just, again, really think matters and that can be transformative, whether it matters to your you know, people around you or in our case, changing the economic system, then it's actually impossible to screw up because <laughs> any experience you have will be an experience along the way. Well, I would have answered for you that you put a hundred percent attention on whatever it is that you decide is important and you don't waste time if you have free time you make it for enjoyment if you have i've seen you cook it's like cooking is the most important thing in your life i've seen you go to a park it's like going to a park is the most important thing in your life and then when you're writing it's like writing is the most important thing in your life a hundred percent that's my observation 
I don't know if you realize it, but from, from outside, it really mm. looks that way. You don't waste time and that's marvelous. But sometimes yeah. that's to protect yourself, right? So for example, when the kids were small, I really suffered when I was traveling, like my heart ached. So I would just block them mm. out. I just block them out. I just don't think about them, <laughs> you know, like as a survival skill, <laughs> like you're, you're in Brazil talking to Zhao in BNDS, like I was with the first time I met uh, Zhao in BNDS and I left my kids behind. I literally would just block them out. And then when you get back, you open up your heart again. So it feels a bit robotic, but it's a way to be in the moment, I guess. But it's interesting. It's an interesting <laughs> bit of advice. Hard. But the reason I said it's not true what you asked is, of course, these are all survival skills. And so what you actually feel inside, the suffering we all have, the anxieties, um, the hate that we might receive along the way. You always helped me when you said, don't let the suckers let you down. You know, it still gets to you. So we're all human. So I think mm -hmm. what's, what's important is not to actually describe this as someone who is successful in all these different things. It's more the path we're navigating and I think learning to speak to people like you um, and to really build such a long-standing friendship as you and I have had that goes both ways. Now we've really been there for each other, not just to you know, cry on each other's shoulders, but actually to share frustrations mm -hmm. and not to be fearful of sharing those frustrations. No? They can, you can admit weakness. You, you have often, uh, well, both, I mean, it'd be funny if we told people what we talk about, but we are very hard on each other. I think we've made each other cry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <But if laughs> let's talk about this making. I mean, you were just mentioning about your new school for social research experience, your mm. early influences. You are actually an activist. So if you see your trajectory from that to individual academic to leader of a, of a European Union project, to founding director of a successful institute, to becoming a major thinker, speaker, and advisor on the global stage. It all began as a young activist. Mm. Uh, can you tell us what that did for you? I mean, what that early influence of engaging with real life and with yeah. real problems. So when people ask me that, or, you know, because it's a question that, people pose not just to me, but to others, you know, tell us when you got interested in something or how you became politicized or whatever. For me, two things, actually maybe three or four, but the, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll focus on two or three. One was I had such a good history teacher in my high school and a very rare class. It was, uh, it was called international history and half the year was on Latin America and half the year was on the Middle East. And his name was Mr. Lucker. He's just uh, step down. He was actually even the history teacher of my brother's daughter, Zola. So she just sent me a picture. She's only 17 of his uh, day of, of departure. And he, um, he just made us study both history, but also what was happening at the time. And of course, uh, in those days, there was the you know, civil war in Central America, the Sandinistas and the Contras. There was still a lot of um, talk like there is still today of what happened in, in Chile with Pinochet. At least he really featured that as one of the big historical moments that he wanted us to kind of think about. And I still remember being at the Princeton Public Library. So I'm born in Italy, but grew, grew up in Princeton, New Jersey. And I was in the public library reading about Chile. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> because I had never until then thought about the US government as, um, you know, as, as potentially like an organized kind of not only war machine, but one that actually trained <laughs> through the CIA and other outfits, um, kind of the torturers, you know, to, to, to put it really bluntly, uh, in Central America, and also what had happened in, in, in Chile. And it just made me start being very critical of, oh, wait, so these positions of authority or these authoritative uh, organizations are not, you know, out there sort of just to protect us, because that's how when you're very little, you think the government is there to do X, Y, and Z for you. And that just opened my mind. I mean, I, I still remember when that happened. I think everyone can probably remember the day they actually woke up. Um, and it just made me start asking all sorts of questions. And coincidentally, that same period, I don't know if it was the same year, the Princeton University students, and you know, Princeton's quite small, so when you walk around, you're kind of in campus, whether you want to be or not, uh, we're having a memorial for the death of Oscar uh, Romero. Remember? The, he, he was an archbishop, no? 
um, who was killed um, for his activism um, and his protection basically of the poor. Um, and I went to that, I think I was just walking by, or maybe I must have found out about it and went to it explicitly. And that again, just completely opened up my mind and is one of the reasons, by the way, this Latin American connection that I ended up doing a minor in Latin American studies uh, at Tufts University. And I did my junior year abroad at the UNAM in Mexico. And the funny story on that, because it's also related to my interest in economics and the, the kind of critical eye, was that I was actually a major in history. I was doing economics classes, but a major in history, minor in Latin American studies. I was actually a double major in international relations. Later, I did a master's and a PhD in, in economics, doing a million courses in economics. But anyway, at Tufts, which is where I was doing my uh, university, the junior year abroad, it's quite common in America to go abroad. And I chose Mexico, I can't remember why, but the program was organized by the University of Chicago. And I was very kind of mainstream. I was there with all the gringos studying, you know, Latin American studies, and it just felt completely useless. So after a week, I was just like, I want to leave this thing. So I decided, I don't know how, I can't remember what made me think that this is the right thing to do. I said, can I just go study with Mexican students? Why do I need to be surrounded by a bunch of Americans doing Latin American studies? And out of the blue, I said, I'd like to go to the economics department, which is weird because I wasn't I mean, you know, I wasn't studying economics besides having studied some economics classes. So they said, no, that's too hard. This is a proper program. It's properly designed for the gringuitos who come and study, you know, Latin America stuff. And I said, please, please, I'll get all the signatures that are needed. So they made it almost impossible. I needed to get like 30 signatures by all the uh, professors in the economics department and others. And I did it. So they finally let me go. And lo and behold, I end up in the economics department of the UNAM, the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, and all they were reading was capital, <laughs> volume one, <laughs> two, and three. <laughs> so I thought I was going to go there to study economics. I got very well trained, not only in Marxist economics, but in, well, actually not Marxist economics, in Marx, reading it in Spanish. It was the Siglo XXI edition. I still have it here. I can show you. <laughs> And, but the coolest thing is, is that there was theory classes and I had never read Marx, uh, but actually most of it was practice, but not practice on the how to, but the experience of understanding Marx through basically people's lives, their experiences, many people were coming from the countryside. And it wasn't ideological at all. It was literally like, um, I don't know how to describe, um, kind of the theory and practice, trying to understand your own, you know, social and economic, uh, condition, the, the condition of the country, situation in terms of development and so on. And obviously they weren't just reading Marx, but that was the big thing. And there was also great philosophers. There was um, Adolfo Sanchez Vasquez. Have you ever come across him? He was in the philosophy department. He was doing Marx and ethics. There was Bolivar Echeverria. Anyway, so super interesting people. But that made me appreciate technological change because so much of Marx, as you know, has to do with innovation. Um, but anyway, so then I went back to Tufts, <laughs> and another big experience was that at the time, as I mentioned, all the political stuff that people cared about were things like South Africa and apartheid, the civil war in Central America, and no one was really paying attention to um, the, the United States as though that you know, we were perfect and all the problems were elsewhere. And again, I can't remember exactly why, but I ended up volunteering for some local trade unions the laundry workers union uh, and the hotel workers union. And uh, those were fundamental experiences for me because I just realized just how, you know, screwed over basically the US working classes. So many things that we take for granted, like being able to enter a union in you know, many parts of the US is actually illegal. So the whole closed shop, open shop, but also they were really fighting for basic rights that in Europe, at least we take for granted and in many countries people take for granted. And so that made me even more interested in economics. And I realized how little I understood about production, technology, and so on. And so these two experiences are what also made me want to then study heterodox economics in the New School for Social Research was and continues to be one of the best places in the world. And of course, the activism bit, you know, all along, I would always go, you know, just like we all do, go to, you know, demonstrations and stuff like that. But probably the most serious activism for me was, uh, on the labor movement. I was very active with the labor movement since then. Mm -hmm. And I'm still very, very interested in work and labor and how in the end, if we can't understand 
work and labor and fight for better work and labor, then you know it's impossible to fight inequality just through redistribution. Good. So talking about that, if we think about your institute, the name you gave it, the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. So was your initial vision that it would be like a research institute or did you already have very clear that you wanted both education of public servants and <clears throat> connection with government and politics and all that? Was, was that clear yeah. from the beginning? Yeah, I mean, if I just wanted the research bit, then it would have been very stupid to set up my own institute because it's it's a huge pain in the butt to run an institute. Um, you know, it's an administrative task. Which, Did you, you know, know it beforehand? Well, no, but my point is it would have been easier just to be, you know, a nice star academic in someone else's department and just write my books, write my journal articles, go around and profess to the world my great ideas as, you know, as I also did for a while. Um, and put the policy stuff at the end of the articles, right? You write a journal article and the last section is policy implications. Listen to me, I'm so smart. Um, and so I was already being invited everywhere after writing the entrepreneurial state. And I just got very, not just bored, but I just thought to really make change happen, you have to affect the mindset. <laughs> it's not just about a better policy. You can't just talk about you know, an active, you know, uh, counter cyclical uh, government spending and have it, uh, you know, fostering inclusive and sustainable growth and blah, blah, blah. Um, it, it needs to kind of start from first principles. And unless we think about how we are also educating policymakers, so many you know, people who end up working in government are also trained in different types of programs, including masters in public administrations. For me, that idea of pushing this idea of public purpose, market shaping, not market fixing, you know, later I use this idea of missions as an example of that, but the bigger picture really is kind of a purpose-oriented economy and shaping markets to deliver inclusive and sustainable growth. That needs a new value theory. That needs a new way of thinking of what is the role of the civil service? What is the state? Um, and how can we hold the state accountable, right? It's not about protecting or, or making a folkloric idea of romanticizing the state, but what is the role of the state in the economy and how can we direct growth to achieve um, a particular type of you know, direction. For me, the three pillars were new education, but not just for civil servants, also the PhD program is uh, part of our education. But anyway, new education, so new training, new research. So these concepts of public value, public purpose, market shaping as a new political economy, framing instead of market fixing, or even systems fixing, which I think a lot of the STS stuff ended up doing. Um, and then the third pillar is working with policymakers ex ante, not just ex post. So instead of waiting to write this great work and then going professing out to the policymakers, listening to them, uh, you know, empathy, meaning putting yourself in their shoes, but listening to what's actually happening on the ground by working with them from the start. For example, helping to set up a public bank as we did in Scotland, and then learning the lessons of how difficult that is, the nitty gritty crunchy questions and bringing back those lessons to the theory, right? So what we call practice-based theorizing is you might have great new theories, for example, about the role of public finance, development banks and so on, but then bringing the practice on the ground to stretch our understanding of the theory and also bringing those lessons obviously to the curriculum. So that's what the Institute's about. It's about putting public purpose at the center of the economy, both in theory and practice, but especially that feedback between the theory and the practice. And talking about that, since you've specialized theoretically in the role of the state and in redefining markets and how they function and so on, what would you say are the most important lessons and ideas that you want to convey to politicians and policymakers in that respect? I mean, how do you approach that? Which are the ideas that you, that you most strongly try to transfer to, to, to convey. Yeah, um, I mean, it's sort of related because I, I have, I just pulled up the, the questions you said you were gonna ask me that I never actually properly looked at. So I'm looking at them <laughs> now. So the next question is related to that. So I'll answer them together because you were gonna ask me about the books, no? And yes. Because in some ways I have a big point that I tried to make and continue to try to make in each of those books. So the first, this kind of need for a new way to really think about where value comes from in the economy. For me, that really was the point of, entrepreneur, of the entrepreneurial state. 
and it continues to be a very um how do you say it's it's it it's not like you write one book and then you get to the next book and then you get to the next book. These are different ideas. No? And then as you move on, some of these ideas start to intersect in interesting ways. But the reason I wrote The Entrepreneurial State is I felt that so many of the policymakers that like to talk about innovation and so on still don't see their own role as being an entrepreneur or, entre or, or, or devising, if you want, entrepreneurial system. So a lot of the capture that happens along the way for example, how the pharmaceutical industry has captured the way that we've designed our intellectual property rights system, which, as you know, is too wide, it's too strong, it's too upstream. Richard Nelson has written a lot about this, um, is due to stories that are told about where innovation comes from, right? So, the, you know, how dare you touch the intellectual property rights, otherwise you're going to hurt innovation. So opening up that box of where does innovation actually come from, which, of course, the STS world sort of did but not really because we didn't actually then go into the government structures themselves. We might've talked about the importance of science industry linkages, of you know, role of innovation agencies, a role of basic research and applied research and the feedback and all those kind of things. But what does that actually mean for the culture, for example, or the design of a public sector organization that also sees its role, not just as fixing market failures, not just as de-risking the risk takers, not just as setting the rules and then stepping out of the way, not just as fixing system failures, um, but actually as being part of the motor of the machine. What is the way that you can embrace risk-taking and uncertainty in that kind of entrepreneurial type of, of public sector institution that works side by side with the private sector? So I'd say the big first idea is that kind of debunking the idea that value is created in one place and at best the state can fix different types of failures, including system failures, and, and redistribute the value, but can actually be a value creator. And that in the entrepreneurial state was actually done a bit more historically in terms of the history of Silicon Valley, not because the US is more important than any other place, but you still have, still today, so many places that try to emulate that system. And so they say, oh, we have great universities, we just need venture capital, and that's somehow going to spur all this innovation mm -hmm. without asking those questions of, what was the actual distributed network of different types of public organizations along the whole innovation chain that accompanied the private sector value creation that was so critical for um, you know, the US uh, uh, competitiveness to actually happen. Um, and, and the value of everything asks what is the underlying theory of value that actually has to underpin that? You know, mm -hmm. What is like literally the new value theory that we should be questioning uh, also because, I mean, I opened up the value of everything with the quote by Lloyd, um, by Blankfein, the head of uh, Goldman Sachs, who after the financial crisis said, uh, Goldman Sachs workers are the most productive in the world. You know, after getting bailed out by a, a 12 uh, billion, um, and, and just the way we measure productivity, the way we measure production, the way we measure growth, obviously then allows those who earn the most also to present themselves as the most productive because we confuse price with value. But what, is, what do we replace it with? And so that was actually a, an important book for me because I had to go back to classical political economy, the physiocrats, all this stuff I actually learned at the new school to trace back how value had actually just even been talked about, had measured, um, and all the problems not only of mismeasurement, but the, how, again, the stories we tell about where value creation comes from then end up being key moments of also um, framing certain types of policies that can also be very regressive. So I tell the story in the book of how both capital gains tax reductions and different types of dysfunctional taxes that have just increased profits over time and not investment have actually been lobbied for with certain both stories and framings about value creation. So I think that's all, it continues to be very important for me, that they be of value um, and that we can't get better policies without really questioning what is value, where does it come from, who creates it, what's the difference between value creation, value extraction, profits versus rents, which I think is the biggest problem today. There's lots of things that are being presented as value creation, but are really just rents. And today the digital economy is very much full of rents. Um, and the mission economy for me was really about the how, and that comes, that's where the practice-based theorizing also became very important to me, which is that how do you actually do this stuff? How do you have a 
you know, not just a sector focused industrial strategy, but one that is truly trying to create transformation. What does it mean to design that strategy so it actually kind of gets lots of different sectors together to, um, to uh, achieve a goal as opposed to the kinds of policies we often end up with that obsess about either technologies, quantum, you know, quantum computing, AI, types of firms, SMEs, cute little companies, uh, uh, sectors, uh, life sciences or something. So how do you transform the vertical, if you think of verticals and horizontals, from not being sectors, technologies, or companies to being problems, and then how you design those policies or ways to get all our different sectors and types of firms. And if you're small, you'll need extra support because you're small, but you don't get support because you're small to really work together with that idea of collective intelligence at the center. And I'm increasingly interested in the idea of collective intelligence. In fact, the new book I'm starting to write is about that, about the common good and collective. Another book, Mariana, you're amazing. Well, I mean, it's the easiest way to get stuff down. Otherwise, you have to write 13 little journal articles that no one reads. I still write the journal articles, but but those are more icing on the cake. And, and lastly, the big con, I mean, you know, the reason I wrote it, and that's why I've conflated these two questions, because I don't just write books to write books. They're books that, for me, bring together like a big idea. So again, debunking the idea of where that, that, that entrepreneurship and risk taking is only happening in the private sector. And what is a risk taking, you know, embracing of uncertainty in the public sector, new theories of value, uh, missions as the new way for actually designing purpose into the economy. This fourth book, The Big Con, was because um, my experience is that so many of the governments I work with, even when they're trying to do the right thing, just no longer have the capacity to do it. Um, the Italian government during COVID, they've gotten a huge amount of money now from the next gen EU program, which is the European recovery program. Two trillion is what the full program is. About 365 billion have gone to Italy. They've just stopped investing in their public sector capacity so they can't even spend it. And already pre COVID, they were giving back money. The structural funds that were being given to Italy often had to be sent back to Europe because they didn't have that administrative kind of absorptive capacity. And so, um, that idea of, not, of resisting that outsourcing, but also looking at how certain large consulting companies have really benefited from that weak capacity with very little incentive to actually increase the capacity in government because otherwise you don't get the next contract, unlike IPP, which you know our whole point is actually to make governments independent of us, even when we're trying to help governments on a particular policy, the education platform especially, but not only. If you look at a lot of these large companies, there's a real conflict of interest, both in the sense that there's, again, no incentive to increase government capacity and they're getting millions, billions, it's, it's, it's a $1 trillion industry, um, but also conflict of interest in the sense that they're advising both sides of the street, you know, the state-owned enterprise in South Africa and the treasury that's supposed to be regulating the state-owned enterprise or the climate uh, consulting while they're also consulting with the fossil fuel companies and none of this is transparent. Um, and also what they're bringing to the table is very, there's very little value added. I mean, when Deloitte was hired, you know, to do test and trace for the UK government, it was just obscene. Like, why would you hire a company that has no expertise with test and trace? Whereas, you know, a head teacher can be hired, an oncologist can be hired, an academic who studied, I don't know, something, you know, underwater basket weaving for 20 years might go and, and, and help someone do that. But often these consultancies actually have very little expertise in the things they're consulting in. And so that was just like, why is it that governments are doing this? And that's the question we ask in that book. And I do think that's the biggest question of our time, that unless we actually have investment within administrative capacity, none of the big policies we talk about, whether it's around climate, health, or digitalization, will, will come about. Hmm. How difficult it is, is it for policymakers that you work with? To, to change from austerity and limited government and all that. I mean, they've been living in that atmosphere all the time. Do you find that they want to change? Do you find that they resist? How, how does it happen? Listening I mean, to you after living in this austerity sort of uh, government just mm -hmm. uh, lets the markets act. See, the thing is, I Do think... They, I, I don't know if that's true. Like, I don't know if austerity is really the problem because first of all, money comes and goes, right? So even under the UK government, first there was austerity and then all of a sudden, you know, someone else comes in, spends more money in something. So I think by us looking at austerity as the problem, we've missed 
the one of the biggest problems, which is the decimation of the capacity of the state. It's not just the so yes, obviously I'm, I'm you know I've been a big critic of austerity, and I could talk for two hours to you why austerity doesn't work even on its own terms, right? In Italy, we did austerity and our debt to GDP went up. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a coincidence, right? If you're just focusing on the deficit and not investing in all the long run drivers of growth, let alone green growth and inclusive growth, you will end up having a denominator that's not increasing. And the numerator, even if it's low 2% increase, you will still have a rise in the ratio because anything over zero is infinity. <laughs> so. You know, that's a whole discussion of why austerity is not just mean, kills our social fabric, you know, but, you know, costs us more eventually because we create problems that we have to fix later, but also it just doesn't even work on economic terms, right? So that's a whole discussion. What I have tried to focus on is not that, why? Because a lot of people say that you don't need, need to repeat what Stiglitz and Krugman and all these people are saying, and they're right. I mean, what they're saying is correct. What I've tried to focus on is something I didn't think people were saying enough, which is the how matters. It's not just to do countercyclical investment. It's not just that we need public banks. It's not just that we need, you know, government working in partnership with the, the private sector. The how really, really matters. And that's where the problem is, both if you haven't invested in your ability to learn the how, so the learning by doing the trial and error, the experimentation with something like outcomes oriented procurement. If you're not allowed to experiment, if you're not allowed to screw up, you're not going to learn. That's the, you know, the subtitle of the big con. The infantilization of government is partly also that. If you don't allow the learning, because we're not investing in the training and the learning within the civil service, you're not going to grow up. You'll stay little. Um, but also... Do, do they accept? I mean, do they, do they yeah. feel good about what you're saying? Or are they... What, well, how, I'm, how are yeah. you finding it? Is there a change? Because... One believes, I don't know, maybe you were being innocent about it, that there is a change since COVID and since the China tensions and all mm -hmm. that, that there is a shift, a very strong shift, both away from on or orthodox economics and yeah. away from the from the do-nothing state. Do you find that the actual people are happy to hear you and to, mm -hmm. and to start doing those things or are they... Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so I, I used to joke, but I still joke about it because it's still true that I would walk in as an economist and I'd come out as a life coach because <laughs> this story about the civil service is also creating value. You know, teachers create value, um, but also that, you know, you can you can design a public agency to be um, dynamic, creative, uh, think of, you know, Reiner's new book on creative bureaucracies. It's, it's actually one of our modules in the MPA is called creative bureaucracies. It's just kind of like a happy message, right? Because otherwise it's just constantly, you know, not only government get out of the way, it's more like don't make a mistake or don't crowd out, only fix markets, don't do anything, you know, grander than that. It's just kind of a depressing message. And as soon as something gets, goes wrong, you're blamed. It's a very, it kind of gets you down. And I really was seeing, this is again, partly why I wrote the entrepreneurial state. I mean, the real reason I wrote the entrepreneurial state was this huge wave of austerity that was starting to happen in those years that I wrote it. And I was like, not only is this stupid on economic grounds, but it ain't gonna get you the innovation you're saying you're going after because guess where innovation comes from. But anyway, so part of that, I think the reason the message has, has taken off at least through these kind of different books, but also the Institute is it's, in the end, a very positive message. It kind of makes you also feel good because you, you'd you be surprised by how much insecurity, and I don't wanna say depression, that's a very strong word, but just people just feel down um, after being bashed so much. So it's not about glorifying the civil service. It's actually about saying, hey, <laughs> what does it mean to wake actually up. design? Well, wake up, that's for sure, but also design our institutions within the state to be able to be flexible, agile, thinking out of the box, creative, learning by doing, and, and this is the important thing, working symbiotically with the private sector, because you're, you know, it, both sides should be equally strong, but also negotiating the deal in the new deal, the deal in the green deal is literally what's the deal. And a lot of my work has shown how we don't strike very good deals. We end up socializing risks, privatizing rewards, but often, even when the civil servants, or let's just call it people working in the state, know how to socialize their rewards, there's no confidence in the room. If the narrative is that you don't create value, think of Obama's um, struggle with Obamacare. 
you know, he finally gets it through. It was watered down, but still he gets it through after decades of people trying. And then the narrative was you meddled in our healthcare. And instead of saying, what are you talking about meddling? We fund 75% of new molecular entities with priority rating. Of course, we're going to make sure that the you know, citizens who helped also pay for it through their taxes of have access to it. He was like, he just basically gave the social democratic response, which is, oh, but there are 60 million people uninsured and it's the right thing for government to do. There was no narrative about we also create that value. We're not meddling in the value created by the private pharmaceutical companies. We're making sure this market is actually a functional, not a dysfunctional market. And we also get our money's worth, which by the way, the military always does. The military gets its money's worth. Why? Because it wants to win the war. So if they fund medicine, which they do, they fund a lot of health stuff because soldiers get sick on the battlefield because they want to win the war. They actually are very courageous in their, in their negotiations with the private sector. So outcomes oriented procurement or patent sharing, knowledge sharing is something the military always does, which we did during COVID because we, you know, and COVID was actually a disaster in so many ways that I've written about, but still the Defense Production Procurement Act was used again in the US during COVID. It's usually just used in war. Why? Because the millions of people are dying. You start treating it like a wartime scenario. And then we go back to normal and think that it's fine just to put money into the system. But I think that, I mean, the, the governments that I've worked with, including now the Barbados government with Mia Motley, I mean, these are kind of self-selective. These are people who, for example, will read the books or know about the Institute who, you know, say, hey, we're so interested in these ideas. Would you be able to work with us? Sometimes we also have philanthropies who then fund the executive education we give to these governments. Or uh, we've worked with um, Camden now, the part of London where I live, to set up a new wealth fund, a community wealth fund. We're also working with Camden on, again, procurement, this whole notion of public value oriented procurement policies, or again, these issues around public banks globally or industrial strategy. These are moments for us also to learn. It's not just about professing. It's given these ideas that we're trying to develop in the Institute. It's only by working with, not at, these governments that our own ideas can also keep getting stretched. And that's why I'm writing this book on the common good. It's called The Political Economy of the Common Good because my most recent experience is that that word is used a lot, the common good. It's used by the Pope, it's used by the Secretary General, but we don't actually have a theory of the common good in economics. There's a theory of the public good and, and global public goods, but it's still what nested within market failure theory and it's still seen as a correction for something the private sector is not doing. We, th we have a theory of the commons, you know, Eleanor Ostrom and so on, but again, very much still nested within uh, neoclassical economics. And I just think we're missing this bold common good idea of a, a really crazy objective to achieve together. So not a correction, but an objective where the how we achieve it matters as much as the what. So the design of all those relational uh, you know, things, including all the contracts, whether they're intellectual property or innovation uh, design issues, matter uh, how they're designed. And if you don't have a notion of the common good, then you end up with things like vaccine apartheid, mm -hmm. where we end, you know. If, if you agree that there is a move towards industrial policy now, beginning with the US and moving around, would you say that there is also a questioning of orthodox economics? And do you think universities that, you know, what, what do you see happening and what do you think could happen? And especially heterodox economics, like, mm -hmm. like the universities we're talking about, yours and, and Spru and various yes. others. Uh, are they, what could they do to actually mm -hmm. get their graduates to be more effective in policy guidance? I mean, because it used to be that it was just a little thing at the end, but now it could be becoming a reality. How, how do you, how would you recommend that that should be approached mm -hmm. in order to, to make it possible to make studies more relevant to practice? Well, it's interesting you, you I mean, first of all, I don't, and I'm sure I'm wrong and maybe I'm just, I haven't uh, opened my mind enough, but I don't know many other institutions that are as wed as we are to both the research and the practice. So I, I'd love to, because I'd love to share ideas about that. And, and by practice, I don't mean the policy implications of our work. I mean, literally working with and bringing back those ideas. So first of all, I would love to share, you know, what works, what doesn't in terms of actually designing an academic institution. 
that is able also to nurture careers in that. Because we know how to nurture careers in research. It's based on your publications, then again, citations and so on. We, for those practitioners that I've also had to hire, right? Because if I think of the work we've done around the world, sometimes it's with us academics leading the project, but we also had to hire through different types of funds, people who would be on the ground with the teams. Um, and those are more like, a, what do we call it? Not so much practitioners, we call them policy fellows that aren't necessarily trying to be academics, but they would love to be with us forever, but we don't because we're in a university have the career structure for them to continue. So it'd be great to have different types of beasts <laughs> within our institution and that where there is actually those career paths also for those who are helping us, like the troops on the ground, bringing back the lessons to the academics without having to set up a think tank. Because I think it's great that we can do this within an academic institution for all sorts of reasons. Um, so one thing is just that, I'd say that what we've tried to do within academia tends to be done more in think tanks. And the problem in think tanks is they tend to do more of the, the tanking, not enough of the thinking. And academia, there's a lot of thinking and teaching, not enough of the tanking. So there's something about just how do you design an academic institution that's able to do what, what we're trying to do? And it, it, it is, I must say, hard, but it's very also rewarding. That's just one thing. Second, I think there's a bit of a, I don't want to say mistake, but a challenge right now with a heterodox community, because the best way to be critical is to know what you're criticizing. And if you never even bother to study properly neoclassical economics, and I don't mean to become like a, you know, massively, uh, you know, published person in that stuff, because that would kind of defeat the purpose. But if you are just attacking kind of a straw man of, oh, they don't know how to talk about production, it's the black box, or oh, you know, neoclassical economics can't deal with, you know, planetary boundaries. It's just not true. There's just a particular way they're doing it. And you better really know that theory and the underlying assumptions that theory is based on if you're going to criticize it. Otherwise, it's, you just stay on the surface. And I hate to say it, um, I think there's lots of that surface surfing. <laughs> um, and for example, uh, and you and I have argued about this um, and, and how it gets manifested not in you, but in some of the critiques, just saying, oh, there's too much math and we need to make it more kind of user-friendly <laughs> or just take away some of the math and do more case studies. That's not the point. The point is which math are, is being used. The mathematics that's been used by neoclassical economics comes from Newtonian physics, all the assumptions of representative agents, the assumptions of unique equilibria, the assumptions that any differentiating process is just kind of a temporary state towards some sort of equilib equilibrating uh, for so on and so forth, you, you know, we, we need different types of maths. Of course, we can also not use maths. There's all sorts of room in economics for, uh, you know, the qualitative analysis. But if the problem ends up being that we say there's too much math, then you could actually end up with a mathless economics that still has all the same assumptions of the one that was using the math. This is just a different, you know, kind of way of doing it. So that again, connection between different methodologies, but also underlying that different theories of value, for example, is really important. And unfortunately, my experience is, especially in places that consider themselves to be interdisciplinary, they allow people to kind of cheat. It would be like an artist who becomes famous just for throwing paint at a wall. If I know that artist can also draw <laughs> and then throws the paint on the wall, then I'm much more impressed by the paint on the wall. If they just jumped the hoops and never even bothered learning how, I mean, I'm sort of exaggerating because I'm sure there's great artists that literally just through paint their walls, but you know what I mean? Like struggling through the method and then rejecting it is a very strong position to be in. And many of the top economists I know, people like Duncan Foley, he was one of my uh, supervisors at the New School. He used to be one of the top economists, a neoclassical economist, then rejected it, became heterodox. Dick Nelson, Sidney Winter, they were in the mainstream. They were top in the mainstream then rejected it and became very strong heterodox. So in that sense, I much prefer multidisciplinary where you go through a discipline, you struggle through it, it becomes cathartic and then you start to bang heads with others, you know, a biologist. But if you jump right to the big mishmash minestrone soup, it's, it tends to be pretty weak. You know, this series is, is meant to entice graduates to go into government, government policy, even politics, to be able to use their knowledge to improve their countries, to help advance yeah. development. But that's, that's so why this is, yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. But the that's thing why is, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. 
No, that's why this is important. If you think it's just about policy and you don't really kill the screwed up theory that's driving your treasury, it's going to come back and haunt you later. <laughs> exactly. Well, precisely what advice would you give? People, because I, mean, I imagine I was going to also mention the role that that actual specialists, not only in economics, but in the whole range of things, because government needs specialists in all sorts of things. If you're if you have a mission which requires a whole range of capabilities, uh, the role of all these people, how do you get them together? Would it be would it be a good idea for academia to be? for all of academia in general to be more active? How about the, the consultants? Yeah. I mean, do you see this? Yeah. How do you see this combination of things acting to? Yeah, so now? it's so important your question that I was almost just assuming that it was understood, but I'm glad you're asking in case there's any doubt. Um, the reason I set up the Institute is I'm hoping that we can get some of the best and brightest students to go back into actually also working in government or even when they're in academia working for real with government, not just in an arrogant way of listen to me, I've written a great paper, I'm gonna come in and give you a little PowerPoint and then leave. So it, we can only strengthen government with new ideas. And so getting the best and the brightest also, especially if we're talking about undergrads and, and master's students, you know, PhD students tend to wanna to go into academia, fine. But we also train you know, undergrads and master's students globally, you know, heterodox economists. And I think it'd be great if we realize that we can only get better policies if those people that we're trying to also train to think differently also work in government and or the training and the textbooks, doesn't have to be a physical textbook, but the new theory actually trickles down into the training of the civil service itself. Uh, this practice-based theorizing stuff, I mean, Ideally, we would also have the PhD students that are, you know, hopefully also stretching all of us in terms of new theory, new future theory, the new Keynes's, the new Joan Robbins's, the new Carlotta Perez's, to be, when I say empathetic, I mean literally putting yourself in the shoes of the government officials. Why? Because it's just so much harder to do this stuff than just to talk about it. Again, I know many people who've written articles about development banks, hardly any of them have spent a day with someone who works in a development bank. And when we set up both the Camden Wealth Fund and the Scottish uh, National Investment Bank, I just learned about a million questions I hadn't even asked myself, including stuff about culture, the culture of, of, you know, of risk-taking within a civil servant institution. Um, uh, all sorts of questions around portfolio thinking from a public perspective, all sorts of questions around different ways to socialize the rewards, not just through equity schemes and so on. So the more, I think we need better policies. I'm just assuming the people on the screen here know that, but I think it's very hard to get those better policies unless they're underpinned with really different economic theory, hence my earlier point, but also real understanding and knowledge of the granular, crunchy, wicked <laughs> issues that the civil servants are actually facing. So, and that includes the language. I mean, that's why I say I start as an economist, come out as a life coach, because so much of the language is dreadful, right? So describing a central bank as a lender of last resort, or you know, if you're just enabling someone, if you're just facilitating, de-risking, think of all the de-risking stuff, what should replace that? So what's the new language, the new story? You only know and realize how, it might be replaced if you're talking and working with and hearing the narratives within these state structures, because otherwise it all remains very abstract, right? Again, Keynesian countercyclical investment. Uh, we know, you know, not austerity, but this, not financialization, but that, not short termism, but long termism. These are all really easy. We can all rehearse them in our sleep, but the how, it's almost impossible to say something serious about that unless you get your hands dirty. And so it's both important for the research to be better informed by getting your hands dirty. So working for a period of your time during your education within government. But definitely the reason I wrote the big con is that unfortunately that has been an ideological battle which has also portrayed government as so inefficient that it needs these consultants to come in and kind of make things dynamic or efficient. And that has also hollowed out a lot of the the civil service itself. And I mean, we talk about like 20 different factors that have caused the hollowing out of the civil service. And so by definition, what we're trying to do is to, you know, hollow it back in, <laughs> strengthen it, 
And just one statistic I'll tell you by someone called Pooja Agrawal, one of the practitioners who works with us. She runs something called public practice and they're trying to get top architects and designers back into city government. Um, and the statistic they tell, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's something crazy that over 60% of architects used to work for the city in the UK. So for the city council, now it's 0.7, less than 1%. So they've all gone private. So the actual council, when it's doing planning and you know thinking about design, it's not with architects. Um, and you know they've that's, also that's a good point because you've always been clarifying that when you say you're against the specialists working as consultants, you are against the big guys who are taking away the whole thing. But but the power of uh, government to be able to use proper specialists, people who really know what they're doing, both inside as staff, but also as consultants, whenever there is something very specific, that that is also important even to know how to do that and for people to be able to help government from outside. But you know, um, in Latin way, America, sorry. Just, sorry, just super quickly on exactly the point you just said, already in mission economy, I talk about that because the head of procurement in NASA his name is Ernest Brackett, said, if we keep outsourcing, we won't even know who to work with in the private sector. So the problem is not whether you're working with the private sector or not. It's that you won't even know how to understand your environment if you're not investing in your own brain. You won't know who to work with. You won't know how to write the terms. You can't judge. You can't you even judge yeah. who's competent. And he said, we are going to get captured by brochuremanship. So they didn't have they didn't have PowerPoints at the time. You know, now the, the McKinsey's of the world have all their beautiful PowerPoints. So they just had these nice brochures. And and he and he didn't say we shouldn't work with the private sector. NASA worked with 400,000 people in the private sector. He was saying we won't know in the future who to work with in the private sector if we don't invest in our own using management speak absorptive capacity. And the book that they on is not, is not against consultants. It's against the big consulting industry that is ridden yep. with all these conflicts of interest and also doesn't bring any real expertise to the table because that's not even in their business model. Yeah. Uh, we're running out of time, so I have only two little questions left. Uh, we have been complaining that in Latin America, the universities, in order for people to go up in the scale, it's much better to publish in English than to help government or to help business or to do anything practical, social groups or whatever. When there is no evaluation, it, it's, not, it, it's not well measured if you actually have an impact in society and business or whatever. Do you think there, it's possible to solve that? Would you say that uh, maybe to give them equal weight, how could we convince them so that, because otherwise, mm. what are other solutions to encourage interaction? I mean, it's it's against themselves if they do it. If they spend yeah. time working with government, if they spend time working with business, it doesn't count. Well, you'd be surprised, you know, it doesn't even count to write a book. <laughs> you can, you only get evaluated, at least in economics departments, with your, you know, journal articles. So even something, so... It's, ah, so yeah, of it's so bad. It's not only about not have. So I, I think there's two things. One, that's no longer that true. Like at least in the UK, for example, the research assessment exercise has a whole category. In called the it. UK, but in Latin America, yeah. it hasn't arrived yet. Yeah. But what I was going to say, the warning I would say for Latin America is be careful. What happens is how do we define impact? And if it, I mean, first of all, there can be shitty impact, right? I mean, shareholder <laughs> value maximization was the biggest impact Harvard Business School ever had. You know, all the companies of the world today that are just buying back their stocks to boost share prices, stock options, and executive pay. That's huge, that's huge impact, right? Or, you know, the neoliberal policies through public choice theory, new public management with so many different governments took on, that's impact. So we shouldn't be neutral with the idea of impact. It's not impact for impact's sake. Uh, what we actually, so there's two different issues. One, definitely, just like, you know, a scientist would be needing to test their ideas to learn whether their model of the universe <laughs> kind of works or not, or, you know, I don't know, actually, if they can do that with black holes and stuff. But anyway, um, we definitely should be just, you know, trying at least to interact with the real world and so on and testing ideas. And that's everything I just talked about before. And having 
university departments reward that instead of penalize that for sure. However, that's easier said than done if, unless you have, <laughs> um, in, in other words, we have to be very rigorous with that idea of impact because the metrics we use to test the impact, this is what sociologists call performativity, the metrics that you use to judge something, to test its performance, to judge its performance, end up affecting what you actually do, right? So there's, a, there's the feedback between bad theory and bad practice. That's actually what my book, The Value of Everything, is all about, how looking at all these dysfunctional policies in the real world were informed by very problematic theory. So I, I think we need both. I think we need to both honor and reward those in academia who are humble enough to not just care about their age factor, but to learn by interacting with the real world, but also be humble enough to recognize, hold on, how will I really test whether the assumptions that are embedded in my theoretical framework are just completely insane or not? And that's where I think economics, uh, this is also one of the reasons I became an economist because I read this amazing book by one of my professors at Tufts who was an economist, Philip Morawski. He wrote More Heat Than Light. And he showed how the type of mathematics that neoclassical economists were using, again, Newtonian physics, was not used with the scientific method, which would be like, here's a problem out there, and I want to understand it, and I'm going to throw all my tools at it. They said, here's out there what I want to prove. <laughs> I want to prove that the capitalist world is you know, optimal, Pareto optimal kind of characteristics. What's the best tool that's going to allow me to prove that? Then a form of economics based on equilibrium theory and so on, Newtonian physics. And that was happening at the same time that the physicists were getting rid of all those you know, assumptions about equilibria. They were going quantum. So it was, he argues it was, it was not the scientific method. So um, again, you know, questioning the underlying assumptions of our theories is just as important as trying to have the impact in the real world. Hmm. I'm going to stop because we only have 20 minutes left and I'm sure there are lots of question and questions in the audience. So I pass it on to Pavel, please. So you pick up the questions from the audience. Thanks a lot, Mariana. It's been no, fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, Carlota. Yes, we have uh, some questions uh, in queue. So the first question comes from uh, Catalina. Catalina, please, could you? Open your mic and ask yourself. Where do you see the questions? I only see the chat. Oh, is there a separate place? Um, hi. Hello. Like, uh, sometimes they just uh, write oh, to me. So, ah, yeah. the secret yeah. questions. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, hello. Hi. So I have actually two questions. Um, the first one that I sent on the chat was when Carlota was asking you about uh, something about resistance to, to change. I just wanted to know because. I, I knew that you were in Colombia, I'm Colombian, um, were like talking to the president. I just couldn't believe it, <laughs> you were there. Um, how do you address uh, resistance to change when you come with these new ideas, yeah. with these traditional politicians that are already in government and uh, present all of the symptoms that you describe in mission economy, for example? Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't believe in like the politician. <laughs> there are some people I've worked with. Again, Mia Motley, if you haven't heard her speeches, listen to them. She's the prime minister of Barbados. Working with her right now, I thank my lucky stars every day. Like I couldn't find someone more inspiring to be talking to, listening to, working with, and then all her civil servants, but also the social partners, the labor unions, and the businesses that were around the table when we were in Barbados. Uh, it was just truly exceptional as an experience. And she was very, very open to learning, to thinking together and so on. Other times you can have very progressive politicians that are quite ideological. Uh, and, you know, we're all ideological ideas. You know, we have certain mindsets, ideas that are kind of forming how we're thinking. But I guess I mean ideological also in terms of being closed. And they might bring someone in, an academic or, you know, oh, you've written a great book, come in. And they almost want you just to be there to confirm what they already think they know. And there's not really that open relationship in terms of affecting their mindset. And you see it, by the way, if they start surrounding themselves only with like-minded people, you know, just, well, think of Trump. I mean, obviously he's on the other side, but he, 
you know, the, the signal that the guy was not very bright was that he was wary of anyone who thought differently from him. So really smart people, it's not just politics, tend to like to be surrounded by people who challenge them. I'm sure all of you enjoy debate, right? So that's, I think, the big difference in terms of my experience also with policymakers in different Latin American countries, but also in the world, is that it's much easier to influence with new thinking or even to learn, right? Because again, it's always a two-way relationship when they are truly not only trying to fight the good fight, you know, a green transition or something, but also willing to really question, it's been the running theme of today's discussion, their own ways of thinking. And when instead they are quite close-minded and think they know everything and they're just using you to kind of come in and tell me this one thing, but I'm not gonna change this other thing, then it's kind of a waste of time. You could just send them a book and say, all right, we'll just read that book, that chapter, if that's what you're interested in. Um, and in Colombia, I think actually one of my best experiences was actually talking to the business sector because I was expecting much worse. <laughs> um, I don't know if Zhao is still here, but uh, Luciano Coutinho was told me in Brazil, and it's definitely what I experienced in Italy. Uh, that we interviewed that him. He, we interviewed him last week. Yeah. Oh, really? So Luciano was yeah, yeah. told me very good interview he said, too. He said Brazil is capitalism without capitalists. You know, so you don't actually have that like desire to invest, <laughs> and there's just a lot of like you know transfers and rents and so on, which is definitely true in Italy as well. And I. It was just interesting. I mean, I can't say that these were the you know, best business people in the world, but that was something I was not expecting because I had just heard a lot of critique of Petro from some of the uh, businesses. And I took part of a, of a discussion uh, where there was a very open, I don't know, it was, it, was, it was a very frank discussion of what the so-called capitalists thought of not just Petro, but just what the challenges were. And I think we need that, like we need to have conversations of these kinds of people. So heterodox economists like yourself need to not only go into government, for sure, <laughs> cut a lot this question, and we should stimulate those experiences by rewarding them in academia, but also really challenge business. And it's hard to do that if you're not in the room with business. I think, for example, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez as a politician could have really strengthened her own ideas by talking more to business leaders who at least were thinking they were trying to do the right thing. You know, like Paul Pullman, who, when he was running Unilever, really resisted the kind of shareholder value maximization uh, form of corporate governance. In fact, he got booted out partly because of that. His thinking is very important to be shared with academics like yourselves, but from his experience in the business community. I suggest that we take, we only have 15 minutes left. So yeah. maybe we take three or four questions and, and Mariana will know that she oh, only has 15 minutes to yeah, answer sorry. them. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's okay. Uh, the second question is uh, from Joao Pedro Braga. Go ahead. And the third one comes from Alice. So first Joao and then Alice, please. There's one from Joao, I believe. Hi, that's me. Thank you for the very insightful discussion. And I would like to maybe just um, put the attention to one specific point, which is the need to rethink the way that we also conceive our PhDs, but also the way that we rethink the public value within our own researches. And that was something that uh, initially, I'm very glad that uh, Carlotta asked the question, because it was not clear for me, how can you actually um, put that new economic thinking within your methods as well? I consider myself as a heterodox economist. I'm going to a PhD right now. But I'm really struggling with how do I tackle my methods, because especially some of my, my understanding is that I should have a pretty defined research method. When my issue at stake, is, for instance, if I want to research the Brazilian Development Bank, mm. um, could be also very adaptable. So I'm, I'm just asking, maybe just to summarize my question, mm. is as a PhD student who is heterodox, who defines themselves as heterodox, how do you think that in practical, way, practical ways we can rethink and incorporate that notion of public value and empathy that you mentioned mm. within our research? And, and that's a question, maybe like a million dollar question, but for me, it would be very insightful to have that, um, those kind of insights from you. Thank you. We need the questions to be shorter, otherwise the questions will lead up the time for the answers. Yeah, the, the second Sorry. one is, comes from Alice. Alice, please. Can you ask yourself that question? 
I, yes, sorry. Um, so I work with pesticide regulation. So I was interested in what you mentioned about uh, sort of uh, having more trained civil servants and if it's possible to have that, is it just on technical information? It can be also trained in scientific uh, discipline relevant to regulation to sort of reduce that information asymmetry and deal with uh, sort of trying to understand if their questions is after, if the question master is good and if they are answering properly. And also if you can have a sort of stronger involvement uh, of the government uh, to avoid the polluter pays uh, principal conflict of interest. So where the industry pays uh, for the scientific services, uh, private scientific services to evaluate their products. And that would help to have national uh, information so it's probably more relevant as well. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. And the last one, maybe uh, from Maruf. Thank you very much. Sorry, I just would like to know, as a younger scholar, how do you begin to balance the need for you to, to have a new idea that you really like to push out there and at the same time progress within, within within your discipline. Knowing fully well that uh, pushing out new ideas may not really be receptive outside there, you may not even be able to publish some of those ideas. And yet you also want to move you know, within, within your career. How do you begin to balance that? Thank you. Thank you, Maru. Uh, Mariana, please, could you go ahead? Mm, great questions, and you're right. I cannot, you just asked me too many questions. You should have stopped I earlier. I know, but... I know. <laughs> Maybe you it's all that. her fault. <laughs> I know, so it's my fault. I'm just We're joking. both guilty. We're both guilty. No, no, I'm, I'm guilty. I, I talk way too much. Um, so yeah, great questions. And maybe we need a part two then to finish this off some other time. So um, Zhao, your question about you're doing a PhD and you know heterodox economists, what are the kind of new also heterodox kind of methods we might be using, but also that issue of public value and empathy. I mean, there's no one answer except that the two must go hand in hand. It's incredible. I know Carlotta has been very frustrated with this. I won't mention in which institutions, but those that pride themselves to be trying to push the frontier of theory and then still feel all this insecurity, almost that they have to prove their worth by using the methods of the mainstream theory as though the two things aren't linked. I'll give you an example, actually, a really cool example. I just came back from Venice. Actually, I just came back from, where the hell was I? I was in Geneva to, to launch the World Health Organization report, but just before that, actually before that I was somewhere else. Anyway, before that, I was in Venice, um, <laughs> Venice Biennale for Architecture, where my friend, Leslie Loco, she's the first black woman ever to run the Venice Biennale for Architecture. And she told me a really cool story. She said that when she was a architecture professor, who then became the dean, of the School of Architecture in Johannesburg, it was 70% uh, white in Johannesburg, the architecture school. And she said the only way to change that monopoly in some ways and that dysfunctional dynamic was to also change how evaluation was done, not reducing the standards. It wasn't like we're going to bring in more uh, Black students by reducing the standards at all. If anything, increasing them, but expanding how we evaluate. And she said that they, for example, allowed performances also for some of the architecture works. And she said that massively changed, you know, that different way, it comes back to that performativity point that I mentioned, you know, how we judge a performance affects what's actually then done. So these aren't neutral. Um, and it just was tr transformative in how it just allowed a school to be much more diverse and more innovative. Um, I think there's been an obsession, for example, within evolutionary economics with agent-based modeling, <laughs> uh, which has almost become like a, a, a video game um, where, again, the risk is that if you jump right to the modeling, you don't even understand what you're looking at. I remember Bain, the guy who's a famous industrial economist, he once said, before you even do anything with your data, like an econometric, just look at the freaking data, sorry, just plot it even. And he said, if, if people just even plotted their data and just looked at it in all sorts of different ways, you would notice really weird patterns that then you realize if you apply some linearizing econometrics, and most econometrics ends up linearizing in different ways, uh, then you wouldn't see this kind of reverse U-shape relationships between profits, concentration, and like firm size. Anyway, so that's, you know, let alone the difficult stuff like empathy, <laughs> which just means actually being trained more by, say, anthropologists. Like if you're going to go into a community and do your random 
control trial uh, testing, RCT stuff, you better first have spent a bit of time even understanding that community. Um, and that just requires academics to be so much more humble than thinking that they're just applying you know, a theory to a place. I remember when Becker, was that his name? That famous uh, neoclassical economist would just apply neoclassical reasoning to anything, including divorce. There was this famous theory of divorce. And that's just comes back to Phil Morawski's point of this anti-scientific method of a lot of mainstream theory, which is you almost already want to know what you want to prove. And then you just kind of choose purposefully the methods. And the risk is when heterodox economists start doing this because they're not really expanding those different uh, uh, methods of, um, of trying to understand the problem for real. Uh, Alice, your point about capture. Um, you know, industry definitely <laughs> has captured uh, much government, but government too, when it doesn't have scientific expertise, is much easier to capture. And we once did a study um, comparing the SBIR program in the United States, the Small Business Innovation Research Program, that tries to stimulate innovation amongst SMEs through procurement policy, and the SBRI program in the UK, which tried to copy it. Um, the biggest difference in its success was that one actually had scientists in it who actually knew <laughs> something about the areas like biotech or something that the firms that were applying to get the government grants were promising to do. And it doesn't mean that we should go to the other extreme and think this is just hard science. I always say we need as much humanities and poets informing an ambitious industrial strategy because they can help us imagine a new world we wouldn't want to go in the same way that Roosevelt brought artists into the WPA program. Um, but it's really striking how little scientific expertise there is inside government and it's definitely needed. Again, we need poets as well, <laughs> um, but I think it's not a coincidence. And it's really interesting in the UK, this guy Dominic Cummings, who if you haven't been in the UK, you won't know all the gossip around it, but it's not important. He was someone in government who said, oh, we have too many stupid people in government. We need geeks. We need to bring scientists into government, which is not the way you bring science into government. The way you bring scientists into government is, you know, one of the good things Obama did is he actually had a stimulus program. He didn't do austerity after the financial crisis, and he tried to uh, direct it in a green way. Then the Tea Party got in the way. But the point is, he was quite ambitious, 800 um, billion in a stimulus at the time, green directed so he managed to get the top scientists to come into government. So Steve Chu, a Nobel Prize winning physicist was like, I'm there. And he ended up directing the Department of Energy. And he would have never accepted to do that if the, if the goal of the program was just to de-risk Elon Musk or to form a carbon tax or help us you know, enable the great green entrepreneurs. The idea was help us direct a stimulus help us set up an ARPA-E, like DARPA that did the internet, but in energy, and just made it really ambitious. And this is another place where missions can be interesting because by making a government agency mission-oriented and kind of outcomes-oriented, trying to solve the biggest challenges of our time, starting with the SDGs, but making them into moonshots, it's exciting. So scientists will be more attracted to work into government rather than governments that at best can talk about crowding in versus crowding out. Um, and of course, there's also a pay issue, but that's another question. And Maruf, uh, great question. And that, that's really the big dilemma, isn't it? That on the one hand, uh, we want to be kind of applying ideas or you might have an existing theory that then you can test out using different models. But what if actually what you're trying to do is a whole new theory? What if you want that real kind of blue sky thinking? And that's more a question for research funding and why it's so important to have blue sky thinking, not just in you know, nuclear physics, but also in economics, like we should be providing grants to the crazy stuff, <laughs> not just to the stuff that's easily implementable to go then you know, write a, a journal article in a five-star journal. And it's interesting, I think two lessons I've learned recently from the research funding. First of all, in Europe, there's something called the uh, ERC, which is just for that blue sky thinking. So you're supposed to apply for other grants, you're just going to apply existing thinking to an area. But if you want to completely rethink, like, for example, if I wanted one of those, I would present my new big thinking on the common good. That's supposed to be a safe place where you can get that funding for big new ideas. But the other thing is, how do you get those big ideas? We should be really banging heads with people that are different from ourselves. And there's some interesting research funding 
in the UK that really worked. It was called Grand Challenge Funding, which tried to get people like economists working with doctors, working with playwrights. And it was re it comes back to my multidisciplinary versus interdisciplinary point. Getting an economist to work with the playwright, we actually put together an AHRC Grand Challenge Fund with, with the arts uh, was so interesting or some recent stuff that we've done with doctors. I mean, you just learn so much. So it stretches your mind because you're not working with others who think like you. And un unlike most grants, if we're serious, I don't know how many of you have gone for big grants. You probably haven't because you're still quite young. But um, when you, you know, go up in the academic ladder, you eventually start getting grants. We tend to do joint grants with people who already think like us. So I've gotten grants with people like Giovanni Dozzi. You know, he's another evolutionary economist. We already would have worked together anyway. I didn't need a grant really to work with him. Um, whereas getting a grant to force you to work with those who are just from a completely different world one of my PhD students, by the way, um, is George the Poet, George Mapanga, George the Poet, who won the Peabody Award for podcasts. He's amazing. He comes from the rap and hip hop community. It's so hard to be a supervisor because as a supervisor, you should be very confident that you're a bit smarter than your student because you're just older. But he's so, he is just one of the most brilliant uh, people I've ever met, but also some, from such a different world than mine, literally from hip hop and rap, that every interaction we have, I just learn so much so, so much. And I think we should structure academic departments, faculties, research funding to reward us to be meeting these people that are just from a totally different world, as well as, you know, doing the stuff within our fields. Otherwise, it'd all be constant, you know, <laughs> lots of heads banging. And anyway, this cruel world says <laughs> that this event is finished. Oh, okay. Oh, God, I need to uh, run to my other one that I was supposed to. I know. That's the reason why I'm not saying, could you stay a bit longer? Because it would be great. I'm sure everybody would be willing to stay Let's longer. Let's do another one. We can do one in six months or something. In the meantime, uh, we'll all have grown up a bit. Okay, that's a promise. <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's not a promise. Of course. Because there are so many things we didn't talk about. I mean, it would be great. Next time we can just so start. I'm holding you to it. In six months, we're having you again.